Joining us now on the show is a voice that at least 90% of our listeners will recognise. She's an award-winning actress, voice artist and writer who has been in blockbuster movies, critically acclaimed television shows and even voiced one of The Sims in a popular video game franchise. Voice of Adventure Time's Princess Bubblegum, Hinden Walsh, welcome to the show. Hey guys, how you doing? Well, very good. How are you doing today? Oh, great. Fantastic. It's uh, really great to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. You're most famous right now for your role in Adventure Time, but you're not just everyone's favourite princess. Over the last 30 years, you've had roles from the big screen and small screen, and we mentioned in the intro, voicing video game characters. I've been the voice of a video game character once, but you seem to have done the the one thing that I always wanted to do and been the voice of a sim person. Oh, (laughs) wow. I didn't know that was a lifelong goal of yours. Um, It's really crazy. It's a crazy, crazy couple of days of recording. Uh, Did you have to learn the actual language? Well, when they had auditions, they kind of had us come in and, and, you know, do it. Like, play the most heartbreaking scene imaginable in made-up gibberish, simlish. Um, Jessica DeTico and I, who are good friends, and she also plays Flame Princess on Adventure Time, but we are child A and child B for The Sims, and we started at Sims 4, and then it's just kind of continued on. Um, so I'm the sweet child and she's the mischievous child. And <laughs> how that day goes is you, you're literally in a windowless room speaking nonsense. Which is, <laughs> so, is very much like how any game of me playing The Sims goes, in fairness. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we just go back and forth and they, they usually want about 15 to 20 usable takes for the same animation. So you have to come up with different language, different feelings, different inflections every time you go through it. And we're looking at a screen of kind of bare bones skeleton of what the animation will look like in the game. And the screen goes three, two, one. And then we start going, yes, to believe. Three, two, one. Then Jessica will do something different. Then I'll do something. And we just go back and forth like 40 times. until uh, we have a lot of stuff we can use. That way, when you're playing the game, even if you're in a very similar situation, um, it it always sounds fresh and new and different. It's not like there's just, you know, oh, it's that one thing we heard them do already. So it's, it's really cool how they've developed this game and made an entire language, an entire, I mean, universe out of it. And we get to record in San Francisco, which is different and fun. Now, uh, you know, there are, there are countless famous monologues from Macbeth and big, <laughs> huge playwrights. Are, are there any particular monologues or things that you said when recording for The Sims that have stuck with you? <laughs> Absolutely not. Not even <laughs> one. I couldn't tell you even one thing. Because um, it, it's all... Uh, we have, like, they give us lists of words. So in case you're just totally having a brain freeze, you can go, oh, right, I can say this word and throw it in, and then it becomes more organic again. But no, I have no memory. But while we're talking about video games, I got to say this video game strike of Screen Actors Guild, performance matters, and it's still going on even though it hasn't been in the news very much. So please support your Screen Actors Guild actors And know that, you know, it really is important to have good quality performance in a game because you spend a lot of time with them, right? I remember reading that it's become as big as or bigger than the movie industry. It's very story-led. There's a lot of acting and orchestration that goes into it. And video games are huge, right? Huge, huge, yes. And what we're asking for as the Actors Union is so tiny. We are asking for things like, we need you to tell us what game we're working on when we're cast. <laughs> Can you that believe would, that? That would seem like, like a no-brainer, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me to do the best job I can do acting, I need to know what I'm playing, you know? <laughs> I need to have the slightest idea what character I'm playing and in what thing. And we're not going to go blathering it all over the place. We're professionals. So things like that, things like if you're screaming bloody murder for hours on end, a human voice cannot that there's there's just no way and people who make video games seem to not understand that 
So this is for making sessions shorter, having somebody on the set that's there to look after our physical health the same way they do in movies with stunt people. That sounds really important. So, yeah, like I said, it's really not that much to ask, but it's still going on. So I just wanted to make your listeners aware. Speaking of movies, you just uh, mentioned that, reminded me that I really love the film Groundhog Day. I sort of end up watching Yay. it every year. You were in that, right? Yay. As the, uh, the woman having second Yay. thoughts on her wedding day. What was it like to be part of a movie that's now referenced so much? Well, Groundhog Day is an amazing film. And I knew it would be an amazing film since I read the script. Um, this was my first big movie. This was I got my SAG card doing this movie when I lived in Chicago. But yeah, it was it was an amazing experience. What I learned since then, having done other films, is with Groundhog Day, every scene is exactly the same, of course, with tiny variation. Um, but when you're making a movie and you're doing coverage, you're shooting coverage, you're doing the same thing all day, every day, exactly the same for each scene. And then you move on and it's a different scene. But in Groundhog Day, every scene was the same scene. <laughs> so the level of repetition just was unbelievable. But yeah, I think that movie is amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, um, in the first draft of the script, it was really Buddhist that he was stuck on that one day for 10,000 years. Wow, and that's time. how long it took him to become a, a good person. But yeah, isn't that an amazing film? Yeah, I've read articles trying to count the number of days that he actually experiences and things. But yeah, I don't yeah. know if anyone's actually come up with an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 10,000 <000. laughs> was the original intent. Now, I really love the film Groundhog Day and watch it every year. You were in that, right? Oh, no, how? sorry. <laughs> Deja vu. <laughs> Deja vu, yes, he <laughs> was. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> let's go back to voice acting. <laughs> what first got you into it? <laughs> well, all acting is acting. All, I mean, all, all acting is acting. There's, there's no difference between if you're on stage or doing a movie or mm -hmm. doing a, a, you know, a video animation, video game. It's, it's all just acting. I had started in theater since I was a kid. I've been doing theater and I did Broadway and stuff. And then I did movies and television, and I kept hearing about animation, but I always lived in the wrong city, because really, it's all done in Los Angeles. And I'm from Chicago, and then I lived in New York. And so it wasn't until I moved to L.A. that I was like, huh, I think I'd like, I would really like to do this, because how, how fun does this sound? It just sounded, it sounded impossibly fun to me, and I was right. <laughs> so yeah, I had a big resume going in and then I got an agent and then I had to audition for a long time because that's a really tight knit group of people that do all the animation acting. But then I got my first show, which was Chalk Zone on Nickelodeon. And I think a little bit before that, I got the, the MGM movies. They cast me as the lead in Secret of Nim 2 and Tom Sawyer. So I just started doing it and never stopped. It really is kind of my, it is my place I want to be, 100%. Oh, that's awesome. And it's funny you mentioned the, the Secret of Nim 2. I, I loved those books when I was at school. It was one of the things that I had to read doing English. So. <gasps> I, uh, I have fond memories of those. Oh, cool. So when it comes to acting along to animation, and this is something that I've always been curious about, do you talk along with the animation or does the animator have to make the character move in time with the words? I guess it's kind of a, a what comes first, the animation or the voice sort of question. Okay, that's a great question. How it goes in original cartoons, which is my favorite place to be, like Adventure Time, or Teen Titans Go, or, you know... They animate to us, so the script comes first, and then we record the script, and then they draw it. So there's, as you can see, an amazing amount of freedom to be an actor in an original piece of animation, because, um, you know, you have a lot of say in how it comes out. For anime, anime was recorded the first time in another language, usually Japanese, and then it's just called dubbing when it comes 
to doing an English track for it. And all the rules are different. You're doing ADR, which is automatic dialogue recording, which means, yes, you are trying to jam a bunch of English words that weren't there in the first place into some Japanese words, lip flaps, which is why sometimes it sounds very <laughs> awkward. But yeah, there's a, there's a whole art to doing that too. But that's the case of when the animation comes first. Or occasionally I'll do pickups on original animations where I'm matching myself or they want to add another line, and so they'll play me what I did going into it, and then there'll be three beats, and then you have to match it to your own character and your own voice. So that comes up sometimes, but mostly with original animation, it's just like I, I get to do an original play reading with the best people in the world, because we usually all record together. Oh, that sounds like an amazing experience. And thinking of you all being with people together... What is it like yeah. working with the cast of Adventure Time? And I'd love to know, are you and Marceline actually besties in real life? <laughs> well, I mean, Adventure Time is such a phenomenon. Gosh, what an amazing show. I would watch it if I weren't on it. I am a huge fan of the show just as it is, and it's just kind of a bonus that I happen to be in it. You know, the cast like the Beatles. I mean, seriously, uh, we were just in Australia doing Adventure Time Live, where we did um, table reads of a few episodes. We did question and answer. We did stuff like that in these big theaters in Australia. And I mean, it was just crazy. The, the love for the show there felt very, very fancy <laughs> being <laughs> in that environment. Marceline is played by the wonderful Olivia Olsen. But honestly, if you look back at all the shows, we haven't really done that many together over the course of all the seasons. And it was really in the last season or so that they decided to bring us together some more, almost in re no, literally in response to the fan reaction to uh, Marcy and Bonnabelle. Isn't that fun that the writers listen to the fans now? It's like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Let's do more of that. That is amazing. That is um, lovely. Yeah, so I don't really know Olivia that well because we never really recorded together. But you will be happy to know that Flame Princess and PB are in real life very good friends. <laughs> I'm really pleased about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you alluded there to just what an amazing show Adventure Time is and the fan reaction and everything. I think a lot of people that haven't seen it take one look at it and think it must be childish. But when you first got the scripts, <laughs> did you see it for the artistically brilliant thing it was going to be? Or was it a bit more sunshine and rainicorns? Oh, no, I knew. I knew this was brilliant from the beginning. And it existed as a pilot short on YouTube way before it was picked up as a series. I don't know if you knew this, but Nickelodeon turned it down. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know. What were they thinking? So the only original cast member from the short was uh, John DiMaggio as Jake the Dog. Mm -hmm. But even Finn, who was then called Penn, was played by Jeremy Shada's older brother, Zach. So that's kind of fun. Uh, but then he grew up. Anyway, it was I think it was Abraham Lincoln on Mars was kind of what was going on in the show. And I just got the humor so completely. And I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be huge. <laughs> this is going to be huge. And so I got the audition for Princess Bubblegum. And I'm like, man, of everything I'm auditioning for, I want this one. <laughs> this is the one I want. Oh, brilliant. Uh, was there anything in particular that you did to kind of get into that bubblegum mindset? Well, I went in and I picked up the sides, which are the scene they give you to read for the audition. And I mean, nothing existed. There was nothing to read, look at or see except this one scene. That's kind of the fun of my job is we go in and we have to create something given very, very little to go on. Like, sometimes you'll get a sketch of a face and go, okay, we want this. <laughs> and you have to somehow divine psychically what you think it is and then have every 
creator, writer, producer, and executive agree that that thing you came up with is what it is. You can see how hard this is. So I just went in for bubble gum and kind of lost my mind. Let me let me show them I, I get the humor. Let me show them I get this. Oh, that's incredible. And while we're still on Adventure Time, is there a particular episode or scene that has stuck out to you in your heart as a real favorite? There's so many. I, I love it when they get really big, when the stories are just these massive thousand-year-old tales of... <laughs> post-apocalyptic, oh, me too. you know, nightmare world. And it's just like, when you think of the show as every minute of the show is a response to that, it's really powerful and childish, not any, not for a minute. And the credit goes to, to Pendleton Ward and to the writers and to the network that let them do what they wanted to do because the Adventure Time doesn't exist because some guys were sitting around in a room going, how do we really appeal to six to ten-year-olds? <laughs> They're going, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did that? And they just followed that. That's, and that's, that's awesome. why it's so great. Yeah. Yeah, and as much as I know that Adventure Time appeals to six to ten-year-olds, it certainly appeals to, you know, 20 to 80-year-olds too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I couldn't agree more. I feel no shame in saying, saying, no, I'm not coming out tonight. I am watching Adventure Time. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Now, going back in time a little bit, in 1994, uh, you won an award for appearing in one of my personal favourite musical plays, The Rise and Fall of Little Voice, well before it became a hit UK film starring Jane Horrocks. You also starred on the stage quite a lot, as you said earlier, before you hit the screen. Yeah. Do you do much with your love of theatre now, or are you really at home with the animation stuff? Well, first, I think it's amazing that Little Voice is one of your favourite plays. Way to go. Good taste. Thank you. <laughs> Good part right. Excellent writer there. I won the Outer Critics Circle Award for uh, Outstanding Debut of an Actress. So it was my first Broadway show. Theatre was something kind of of my past. I loved it. I loved it hard when I was doing it and then it just it's crazy but I just sort of grew into something else it was sort of like okay I did that that was great I loved it and now I want to do this other thing <laughs> so I just kind of switched just kind of shifted over I kind of lost interest in being looked at honestly it's more fun to be heard well as <laughs> someone on the radio I can definitely relate to that <laughs> yeah. yes <laughs> know what I mean. <laughs> of all your roles, all the characters that you've brought to life, is the one that stands out as your favourite? And why is that? Um, no, they're all, I, I know everyone hates this answer, but they're literally all me. I couldn't do them otherwise. So, like, someone really dark like Harley Quinn, that's me. Someone really light and bright like Starfire, that's me. You know, <laughs> the nun is... The only one that matters is the one I'm doing at that moment. If you could play anyone, real or fictional, is there somebody special that you'd love to bring to life? Well, I don't really think like that since I don't have control over the kind of things that are going to be produced. Mm -hmm. So I'm more about just keep it very loose and stay open to whatever comes to me as far as ideas for what's presented to me. And believe me, everyone you know, in animation, audition, has to audition for stuff every day. We do this every day. <laughs> and does it get old? Yes, it does. It's very <laughs> old. No matter how many things you've been on, it's really rare that someone says, oh, let's just give them the part of the nine-year-old otter. <laughs> because instead they go, away. let's hear what they're going to do with it. I'm sure we've got some young and aspiring artists and actors and creative types listening. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, creators first. If you don't create it, it will never exist. So create it. And don't you feel better once you've created something? Let it out. That's my advice for you guys. Then actors, remember, there is no such thing as shooting to be a voice actor. No matter how popular animation has become, you still don't shoot for that. You have to have so much else going on. You've got to be an incredible actor in your own right. And you have to combine that with maybe being a brilliant artist. 
the same time. You know, make your own films to be in on YouTube. Development people are watching YouTube every day, believe me. But you need a resume. You need to join the union. You need an agent to get in the door, and you need a lot of experience to get an agent. It's that catch-22 thing, but we've all overcome it, and I know you will too. Where can fans come and see you next? Are you at any conventions coming up? I am so glad you asked. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I am getting ready. I am coming to Europe. I am coming your way. Yay. I will be in <laughs> Hanover, Germany on May 20th and 21st, right around the corner. Come on over to Hanover. I have no idea if anyone will know me there. So it will be exciting. <laughs> okay. And then I am coming to MCM London Comic Con, and I will be there on May 26th and May 27th. And if you come, the super exciting part is everybody who comes gets one free autograph from me. Wait, are you coming? Will I get to meet you? Yeah, sure. Oh, excellent. Okay, good. <laughs> if fans want to tweet at you and find you online, how can they do that? See me on Twitter. My handle is Hinden is here. So, yeah, follow me on Twitter. That'd be great. Last but not least, we ask all of our guests to pick a song for us to play. What would you like us to play this evening? I would like you to play It's All Too Much by The Beatles. Lovely. We'll play that for you now. Thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing everything with our listeners. Thank you, guys. It was really fun. And we look forward to seeing you in London. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs>